me in Matthew chapter 21 to start off with. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. Message like I'm going to preach today, I can just about figure. I don't know what it, I thought. I, yeah, I do know what it is. Say it. When I preach a message, and y'all see what I mean in a little bit. When I preach a message like I preach today, it never fails. We'll be missing a bunch of folks. Well, Satan, I want you to hear what I got to say today. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. I want you to do our spiritual breathing this morning. Let's get prepared for this morning. You breathe, as you breathe out, let go of all that junk, any of that stuff that you might have brought in here with you, anything that's burdening you this morning, anything that's hindering you from being ministered to by God's Holy Spirit, you ask God to take it away as you breathe out. And as you breathe back in, you ask God to replace that with His perfect Holy Spirit this morning. Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. And Jesus entered the temple and cast out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house should be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. Father, I love you. I praise you. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Father, I thank you for every opportunity to preach your word, Lord. And Father, I just pray this morning that I can decrease, you'll increase, Lord, that you'll hide me behind that cross, Lord. I pray your spirit go out before me, preparing the hearts, preparing the minds of each and every individual, Lord. Father, I just pray that you bind Satan, loose your spirit on this group of people who you love. In Jesus' name, amen. What do we go to church for? What do we come here for? Why do we come on Sunday mornings and gather here? Why do we come on Sunday nights and get together and Wednesday nights? You know, why do the men to get together on, on Monday nights? Why, what do we come to church for? Is it so you can come on Sunday mornings and be seen so maybe people won't doubt your faith? You know, maybe if you come on Sunday morning, people will see you and they'll say, well, he's got to be a Christian. He's on church on Sunday morning. Can't doubt his faith. Is it because you feel a religious obligation? You know, we feel like it's our religious duty of the week to come to church on Sunday morning. Is that what it is? Maybe, maybe you're here for some kind of personal gain. I, I've been in churches. I knew one case in an instant, a church, or one case in a church where uh, Cheryl and I served in, there was a, a successful businessman there. And they had told the story about a man that had come before we ever come to this church. A man that had come to that church for the sole means of getting close to that successful businessman. They needed his influence. This person was planning on running for office, and they needed to get close to there. They were there for personal gain. Now, I'm going to tell you, you think, well, that's a strange story. It's not that strange. You see that a lot in some of your bigger churches. You know, First Baptist churches wherever seem to have that label by a lot of people. I'm not saying all of them, but it seems like your, first, your big First Baptist in big towns, they seem to have that label. It's not just your Baptist church. A lot of your bigger churches, people come there for some kind of gain, political connections, whatever. It's that season right here. Elections are upon us. I guarantee you this morning, not just here, but across the country, there's more politicians in church than they were this time last year. It's a voting year. Are you coming for some kind of personal gain? Have you ever really examined your motives for coming? Have you really ever looked at your motives for coming? <clears throat> you know, I know for a fact, one of the reasons I ask this, I, I know for a fact, it never fails. If the preacher's not here, I, if the preacher's not here and folks know the preacher ain't here, it seems like the attendance will drop. Am I right? Some of y'all have been in church for a while, you know that happens. If the preacher's not here and people know that the preacher's not going to be here that Sunday morning, it seems like the attendance drops. Now, I don't necessarily attribute that to preacher worship or anything like that. I think a lot of people are just scared the preacher's going to be calling them and drilling them, and they're going to have to lie to the preacher then. So. <clears throat> but you see it a lot. I mean, I, I'm going to be gone one Sunday in September. And this is, hey, this is a hidden challenge here in case any of y'all miss this. I, I really hope I don't hear any reports that, oh, attendance was so low the day you were gone. I hope it's just like it was any other Sunday. Yeah, I'd love to see that, but you see that a lot. What are our 
reasons for coming to church. Why do we come to church? Is it just so you can come hear me preach? Is it just so you can, some kind of personal gain? What is it? Have you ever looked at biblical reasons for coming to church? And that's what I want to look at this morning. We want to examine some biblical reasons for coming to church, for being a part of a fellowship and being here. One's to worship. We know we come to worship. That's why God put the church here. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. He says where two or three are gathered. That's all it takes, two or three. Not a hundred, not a thousand. It don't take a mega church to initiate worship. Little old small country church can do it. Little old Bible study in your house can do it. The assembly, two or three are gathered. Two or three constitutes a fellowship. That's all it takes, two or three to constitute a fellowship. Just a few people that are united in prayer. We do that and God says, I'll be there. He says, I'll be there with you. Two or three of y'all, y'all constitute a fellowship. You there, you genuine, you, you ready to worship? I will be there. But you say, well, preacher, I can worship anywhere. Hey, that's true and you should. Now, don't get me wrong. That is true. You, you can worship anywhere. You should worship anywhere. But God likes his people to gather together. He does like that. He never meant for you to enjoy to enjoy him alone. You know, from the very beginning, God recognized that man needed fellowship. Genesis 2.18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good. Remember, this is right after he's created Adam. He's created Adam. He's looking at Adam. He said, Adam, this is good. You know, I like this. I like this creation I've made. And then he gets to look and he says, then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. We're designed to fellowship. God's seen right there that we needed somebody. We didn't need to be alone. We're designed for fellowship. We're also designed for worship. We're designed to worship. Every one of us worships something. Everybody here worships something worship money, you can worship <clears throat> your kids, you can worship your spouse, you can worship your, your material things. Every one of us has got something you worship. And if you're the person that says, I don't have anything I worship, then you're probably, your worship is yourself. You are probably worshiping self is what you're doing. You're saying, I'm above God, there's nothing above me. You're just like Satan was, Lucifer was before he fell. You put yourself above God and you've made yourself the object of your own worship. Every one of us worships something. So when we put two and two together, we put a man that's designed for fellowship and a man that's designed for God. When we put them together and we start worshiping in fellowship, great things happen. Great things happen then. Great things, great enough things that God says, I'm not going to miss that. I'll be there. I'll be there with you. Worship begins when we begin, start being obedient to God. One of the things God's told us to do is fellowship and worship. When we start beginning be obedient to him, we'll see real worship begin. At that point, that's when Christianity 101 becomes a reality. I've told y'all, i told y'all, Christianity 101, he's God, I'm not. When we start being obedient to God's word, that's when Christianity 101 starts becoming a reality. He's God. I'm not. Another reason we, we gather is to grow. Is to grow. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Y'all heard me preach this, preach this. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembly together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer of Hebrews here says we're to encourage one another. When the Bible talks about encouragement, it's not merely talking about to make somebody feel good about themselves. See, that's what we think encouragement is sometimes. Just make somebody feel good. You know, somebody comes in with the, the ugliest pair of shoes you've ever seen, and they man, you like my new shoes? And you try not to lie to them. You say, well, they're unique, you know, or something like that. Y'all ever done something like that? Yeah. You're trying to encourage them by making them feel better. That's not what biblical encouragement always is. Biblical encouragement sometimes is just... 
Biblical encouragement usually means that one is calling someone to their side in order to teach, comfort, strengthen, or push them to act in a certain way. That's encouragement. People encourage others, say with love what a person needs to hear. Not what they want to hear most of the time. They say in love what they need to hear. Somebody that encourages does it when they need to hear it. That's what he's talking about and encouraging. He's talking about calling somebody to your side so that you might teach them, you might comfort them, you might strengthen that person. Or you might push them to act a certain way. That's what he's talking about when he talks about encouragement. That's why we need to come together as a fellowship and encourage one another so that we might do these things. And when we encourage each other, we help each other grow. Which brings up another question, what do we need to grow in? What do we need to grow in? We need to grow in grace. Titus 2, 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Grace becomes a teacher. We need to grow in grace because grace becomes a teacher. It becomes a teacher of what it teaches you. It teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, to live righteously, and to live godly in the present age. So we need to grow in this grace. We need to grow in this teacher. Many of y'all out here have taught a long time. There's several of y'all have taught for a long time. Taught long enough, I remember y'all teaching me, and that's been a while. I bet few students y'all had got it the very first time and retained it. A lot of things you had to repeat, you had to keep drilling into it. If them kids were anything like my kids, you had to tell them over and over and over and over and over. Sometimes it just takes drilling it in. <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure I was like that too. And if you, don't, you can just ask my daddy, and he'd probably tell you the same thing. You had to tell him over and over and over. We don't always get it a few times, so we've got to grow in this grace. We've got to grow in this teaching this instruction of grace. Grace becomes our teacher, so we've got to grow in that. We need to grow in love. James 13, 35, 30, James 13, 34 and 35 says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved for one another. He didn't say, by your church attendance you'll grow he never said that by your church attendance people will know you he never said that he never said by your church lingo people will know you You know you hang around the church it don't take long lingo. hang around the church you learn the lingo you learn the things to say not to say a lot of times that ain't what people's going to know you by by your lingo or whatever people's not going to know you by your giving he said people's going to know you by your love for one another. People are going to know you're my disciples by your love for one another. So we need to grow in our love. And we need to grow in the word. James 1.22, but prove yourselves doers of the words and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Hard to do, ain't it? Hard to do. The, the King James says, be you not a doer of the a hearer of the word, <laughs> be ye not a, <clears throat> just a hearer of the word. I can't even think of how it is this morning, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer as well, lest you deceive your own self. Amen. <clears throat> Got my own self off track here for a minute. God's word contradicts the evilness that lies within us. I mean, there's an evilness that lies within each and every one of us, and God's word contradicts that. So it's not, it's hard, it's easy to read, it's easy to hear God's word, but to be a doer of God's word, to apply God's word in our life, that takes some time. That takes some growth. That takes a little bit, you know, that don't just happen overnight with everything. And you know, what might be baby steps for me might be a grown walk for somebody else. 
You know, a person that's caught up in adultery, they hear a verse like flee fornication, and that's convicting. That's a hard verse for them. Somebody that's not caught up in that particular thing don't think much of it. Well, flee fornication, well, yeah, of course you are supposed to. You know, we got to grow in that word. You know, it's hard. It's harder to do what is right than what is wrong. It, it really is a lot of times. It's harder to do what is right than wrong. A few examples of that. You, you ever had somebody ask for your last dollar, knowing that you they need it worse than you do? Know that they got a real need? Know that you might have a check coming the next day, but they don't know when their next paycheck is? Hard to give away that last dollar like that, ain't it? You want a real good example of how hard it is to do right from wrong? You put two kids, take two little old kids, and put them in a room with one toy. It's harder to get them kids to share that toy than it is for them to fight over it. They'll just fight over it naturally. <coughs> Sharing it comes with time. That, you have to teach them to share that toy. You got a broom bed out there that's just waiting to be to load your boat on a Sunday morning. Only time you can get there. It's easier to get up and go to that broom bed and he just come here and hear me run my mouth for a half hour or so. Yeah, right, TJ? Amen? Yeah. I understand. Yeah, it's easier. We got to grow in God's Word. Another reason we're here is to serve. Romans 12, 1. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, susceptible to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Why do people come to church looking to be served? They come here, you don't know how many times, I know some of y'all have heard it, we've talked about it. People come in here and they say, well, you know, we really like your church, but there's just nothing here for us. There's nothing here for my kids. It's because we ain't got the people. We need more servants. If you would come and be a servant, we could start growing some of these things. We're here, we're looking for people to serve. We got something for you. We really do. We've got a place of service here. We will put, yeah, we'll put you to work. I know that's a bad word, but we will put you to work. We'll put you in a place of service. It might not, you might not think it's much, but we we have places of service. And we've been called to serve. It's part of what we, that's part of why we're here is to serve. This verse tells you to turn yourself over to God for service. Give it all. Give everything you've got. Over here with the Hellfighters, there's a, there's a thing hanging outside. Some of y'all have seen it. And it's kind of a slogan we got. It says, Extra Mile. And we kind of have to remind ourselves sometimes. We go the extra mile. And I'm going to tell you, that might not sound like much to you. But that meant a lot to me. Because I'm going to tell you what I've learned over time with that. See, here was my thinking. We'll take those fellowship dinners we do the third Tuesday every month. We put on a big shindig up there. Usually have around 100 to 150 people come through there. Never fails, there's going to be somebody that complains. You know, you're going to have them in every crowd. I understand that. <clears throat> and my, my first instinct, it's a free meal. What are you complaining about? You know, that's what I want to say to start with. But what I've learned to do is take that. What we've all learned to do up there is take that and say, well, how can we improve? How can we serve you better? You know, that's hard to do. Because I want to rear up and say, it's free. What are you complaining about? You didn't pay for this. But what we have to learn to do, and some of them's legitimate. They, a lot of them's illegitimate, now I'm going to tell you. We've had some that's just foolishness. But some of them are really legitimate. What do we do with them? We take them and we say, well, how can I serve better? That's got to be our attitude. How can I serve you better? What can I do to be a better servant? Remember what I preached a couple weeks ago? Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, you do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. We should do everything heartily with our whole heart. Whatever we do for the Lord... We should do it heartily with everything that's in it, and that should be our attitude all the time as we work for the Lord. Another reason we're here is to give. You say, uh-oh, he's about to get into tithing. Right, we get into that in a minute, but yeah. 
Yeah, don't get nervous. I ain't going to beat you up about it or nothing like that. But we are to give. What are we to give? We're to give our time for one. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as, the, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Believers are required not to have any fellowship with the works of darkness. We're not to have fellowship with the works of darkness. We're to reprove them. We're, we're to do away with them. This whole deal, I can do what I want and when I want, that's not biblical. There's nothing biblical about that. We were created by him and for him for a purpose. Every one of us created by him. We were created for him for a purpose. Ever heard that saying, living on borrowed time? <laughs> oh, so-and-so, living on borrowed time. Let me tell you something. Every one of us is living on borrowed time. Amen? Yeah. Every one of us is living on borrowed time. You don't know when you're going to walk out of that door and take your next breath. You can fall out right here in that sanctuary. In this sanctuary. If you do, it's a good place. We've got several nurses here. Uh, <clears throat> But you can fall out right here. You don't know. We're all living on borrowed time. The question is, who's holding the note on that loan? Who holds the note on that loan? We need to be asking ourselves. It's God. God knows when we're going to take our last breath. God knows when we're, if we're going to take another breath. It is God himself that holds that loan. Holds that note on that loan. So he's the one we need to be serving. We need to... He's the one we need to be thanking for our time and to be giving back for our time. See, it's just like, just like I told you and told you about money. We've talked about money. God's, a, I'm not. It's not that I'm giving ten percent of my money. It's that God's allowing me to keep ninety percent of my money. It's not that I'm giving a little bit of my time. It's that God's allowing me. These 42 years so far, so I'm just giving back a little bit of what God's allowed me to have. We need to give of our service. You know, there's a saying in churches, 20% of the people do 80% of the work, and you can put that in just about every church. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Now, I, I've been, I'm really proud. I am really proud. I've had people come to me, hey, how can we help with the... Uh, fifth quarter. Have folks this morning, hey, we know y'all go down there with the homeless. What can we do to help? You know, had people, and some of us don't know nothing about sewing. We've got a, a pretty good sewing ministry going out of this church. Had people come up, I can't sew, can't do nothing like that, but what can I do to help? We're lucky with that. We're blessed with that, I should say. But most churches, 20% of the people do 80% of the work, and you can just about count on that. You've got a handful of people that do everything at that church, and the rest show up on Sundays. We're to give of our service. 2 Timothy 2 3 says, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. There's no doubt you've been called to service. Just like a soldier's been called to service, you've been called to service. Why are there so many people that act like they're in the reserves? Why are there so many people out here in the church? I'm not just saying east side. I'm saying in the ecclesia. I'm saying in the church in general. Why are there so many people acting like they're in the reserves? I'm just going to sit back here and live my regular life while I'm waiting for the battle to break out and them to call me. The battle's here, and you need to be out there. The battle is amongst us, and we need to be on the front lines. we first get saved this come up this morning there in the Bible study up there and I, I wrote I hand wrote it on the notes there because I thought it was just really relevant when we first get saved you think about it when we first get saved we're on fire and we want to we want to serve we want to do this and we want to do that boy we just want to and somewhere along the line that won't turn to turns into I've got to I've got to I remember Oh, when God first called me to preach, I wanted to preach so bad. Well, I wanted to preach just wherever I could preach. I preached at that truck stop up there, and boy, the first church that asked me to come, boy, I was there. I was ready. I didn't care. I wanted to preach every Sunday. That church called me. 
There was six people on that church the first Sunday I went there. I didn't care because I was in a church where I could preach every Sunday. I wanted to. And then after a little while, it got to where, well, I got to preach this Sunday. I've got to preach this Sunday. Folks, I don't even think they're hearing what I'm saying, so I got to preach. But I got to. That's my obligation. We get like that. We get like that sometimes. We start off, boy, we want to. We want to. We, I want to do this. I want to do that. And somewhere along the line, it turns into, I've got to. I've got to serve here. I ain't got no choice. Got to go do it. We need to keep that want to going, that desire going, <clears throat> that want to serve. That's what we've been called to do. And here's one y'all all been fearing, give of our money. Give of our money. I don't think all y'all have been fearing it. I really don't. I think this church is a really giving church. But a lot of folks don't like to hear this. Don't like to hear this part preach. A mother wanted to teach her daughter a moral lesson. She gave the little girl a quarter and a dollar for church. Could you put whichever one you want in the collection plate and keep the other for yourself, she told the girl. When they were coming out of church, the mother asked her daughter which amount she'd give him. Well, said the little girl, I was going to give the dollar. But just before the collection, the man in the pulpit said that we should all be cheerful givers. I knew I'd be a lot more cheerful if I gave the quarter, so I did. <laughs> So, uh, uh, yeah, it's funny, but that's kind of our our thoughts on giving sometimes when it comes to our money. We want to hold on to that. But listen to what God's got to say about giving. He says, bring the whole tithe, the tithe being a tenth, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, a lot of people stop right there. A lot of preachers stop right there. God said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and that's what you've got to do. That's what you got. But listen to what God goes on to say. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now on this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up for you the window of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. God says, test me and see if it ain't so. He said, bring your tithe. Pour it in there. Bring it to the storehouse. Dump it in there. Test me and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you. That kind of contradicts some people's way of thinking about giving, don't they? And I've, I, let me tell you, I, I, I ain't been preaching that long. Yeah, but I've been preaching long enough that I've heard it all. When he, tithing especially. When I've heard, well, God don't need my money anyway. I, yeah, God don't need you. Yeah, he owns cattle on a thousand hills. Yeah. He, he's got street, a street up there that's paved with gold. He don't need your money. Salvation. I, I like what Tony Evans said, though, one time. Salvation's free. Ministry is expensive. Yeah, we do got a lot of bills to pay here. We do got missions going on out of this place. Yeah, it gets expensive sometimes. But that ain't even what it's about. What it's about is you turning it loose. You not making that your little God. That's what it's really about. I've heard people say, I give my time instead of my money. Yeah, that's because you ain't learned to turn loose of that money yet. Give you time and your money is what God's telling you to do. I've heard people say, I feel like I'm being extorted. I've heard it preached like that too. I'm going to tell you, I've told y'all, just like I said a while ago, I, I don't teach it and I don't preach it that you've got to give 10%. I preach it and teach it that God's allowing you to keep 90% of what He's gave you to start with. And that should be our attitude on it. We're not giving up 10% of what's ours. We're keeping 90% of what God, what is God's to start with. But I've heard all these excuses about money when it comes to money. I, I've heard all these excuses, and they all boil down to one thing. You don't want to give your money. That's what they boil down to. You don't want to let go of it. Meanwhile, God's trying to teach you something in this. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and by some longing for it, and some by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That love of money. That love, see, you hear it preached all the time. Money's the root of all evil. Money ain't the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of it. And that's what God's trying to teach you, is not to be in love with that. I've let you have it for a purpose. Turn it loose. That's all God's teaching. <clears throat> Michael had, had 
texted me the other day. He said, what you preaching on? He, he was kind of trying, I think, kind of trying to put the music around it. And I said, I really don't know yet. I've been struggling. I've been struggling with what to preach on this week. <clears throat> he asked me again this morning. He said, I ain't bothering you no more, but what? And I told him what I was preaching on. He said, well, I'm, he said, well, I'm, I got the music around storms. Storms have just been on my heart. What he told me. Y'all notice the music had to do a lot with storms. And I thought about that. I thought, well, why would God put that on his heart and God put this on my heart? And then I thought about it. It hit me. I bought a Cheryl's pen and wrote this note on my notes while we were singing. The church is our storm show. This is a place we can go and gather with others and be encouraged. You know, Cheryl, she, she, and the reason Michael said what he said about to about scare Cheryl, she don't like storms. She does not like storms. They scare her. They make her nervous. I know some people love storms. They just love to hear the thunder and all. Cheryl's not like it. And I pick at her about it. Oh, I'm not going to pick on you this morning. I'm really not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I know she thinks that's what's coming because I do pick on her a lot. She's always talked about she would love to have one of them underground storm shelters. Now, I don't like the thoughts of them because I just like going into a casket and me going down in there. <laughs> but she's always talked about it, and I got to thinking about it. That's kind of what church is like, man. Church is our storm shelter. It's, it, we could come here and get away from life's storms and have others to gather around us and encourage us and help build us up and help us grow. So yeah, it all went together. It went together beautifully. Well, I thought. I think God taught us all something here this morning. He's teaching us something. We have our storm shelter here. <clears throat> when those storms of life come, God has designed this, this beautifully, this beautiful fellowship amongst believers. And if we do it biblically, if we do it the way God designed it, it is such a beautiful thing he has done. Too many times we don't. But if we'll start provoking unto each other love and good works, we'll start encouraging each other in a biblical manner instead of tearing each other down, fussing and fighting and you know, provoking each other. We'll do it like the Bible says. Oh, what a beautiful thing God's designed to help us with these storms of life, to help us get through these storms of life. If you're here today, Michael's got something he wants to show. I'm, I'm, you know what? The altars are open. I'm not going to get up here and beg you to come to the altars this morning. If you need to come, you come. We'll be up here to pray with you or whatever. He's got something he wants to show you. He's going to show you and we're going to close.